Is this a proud moment for Britain? Do you stand shoulder to shoulder with the Prime Minister? Or is he leading us into the jaws of yet another drawn-out conflict? We'll talk to Lindsay German in a moment, who's from the Stop the War Coalition, is very doubtful about this whole business. Uh, first, let's get some more facts from Professor Michael Clark, who's military analyst and director of the Royal United Services Institute. Now, I'm trying to work this out. It's a no-fly zone. It's not an occupation. But they are able to take action to stop the troops going into Benghazi. Well, uh, they are authorised to uh, attack uh, Libyan forces in order to safeguard the safety of Libyan uh, civilians, so you could interpret that as, as a licence to attack uh, Libyan forces on the ground. That would be a pretty big military and political step. So that's rather like remembering the, the road to Basra in the, in the first Gulf War when Saddam Hussein's army just got blown up on a, while yeah. on a road. They could do that. They, well, they could, but remember that uh, Libyan forces are far, are far less than an army. They're, they're pretty badly stretched, and there's not that many of them. The thing that's making the difference around Benghazi is that they do have artillery and they do have some tanks, but not that many. But but a certain number make a difference. And so whether you, c you can easily locate and target those accurately and, and avoid civilian casualties is, is a question to be addressed in the next uh, 48 hours or so. so but it could happen. If you're Colonel Gaddafi, what do you do? If, if, if he behaves the way Saddam Hussein behaved and Milosevic behaved, they would make sure that their armour and artillery was near to civilian centres so that it was difficult to attack without causing civilian casualties. Now, that may or may not be the case, depending on how close they get to Benghazi, whether they get pushed back to Ras Lanouf and so on. But in general, once, once anybody starts attacking ground targets, it gets very messy. It's pretty dangerous for everybody concerned, the pilots as well as people on the ground. It is a big step to take, but the, the UN has authorised that as a possibility. Uh, the no-fly zone itself um, will, will be more of a political gesture. It won't make that much difference because helicopters and aircraft with uh, flying short ranges to bomb civilian targets on the ground, Libyan aircraft doing that, it's very hard to intercept them in, in time. If the no-fly zone is to be made effective, then basically the Allies have to launch attacks on the air infrastructure of Gaddafi. They have to take out the, the air defence systems, the airfields and so on. So again, that's a pretty big step. It's not as big a step as attacking Libyan forces directly around Benghazi, but we will see. These are pretty dramatic times and the, the French are champing at the bit. Uh, the British, I think, having gone along with this, uh, tried to push this resolution and finding that the United States falling in with it very late in the day, I think that they will probably find that there is an, an expectation that they will act sooner rather than is, later. Is it possible that uh, Colonel Gaddafi and his forces may go into Benghazi in the next 12 hours because the, the no-fly zone won't be up and running until Sunday? He might try, but I doubt if he would succeed. Benghazi is a really tough nut for the Libyan forces to crack. They, I mean, they can make lots of gains in the towns along the way, but Benghazi is, is the seat of the rebel movement. It is, it's always been anti-Gaddafi. There's a lot of people who will defend it. I think his forces are, would be hard put to take Benghazi. Do you think this is the right decision? Uh, after the last couple of weeks, I think it is, because inaction is now probably worse than action. But strategically, uh, the United Nations has committed itself to a pretty big course of action. And the thing is different this time is that the Arab League and the Gulf Cooperation Council called for it. This is not Britain and America uh, launching another adventure into the Middle East. This is the Arab League asking the UN and Western forces to back its desire to do something about the situation in Libya itself. So that, that, that's pretty different. On that basis, Lindsay German, that, that does make it something that is uh, it's easier for Britain to say yes to, at the very least. Well, I don't... I don't think it is, because I think if you look at the role of the uh, Arab League and the Gulf Cooperation Council, uh, as I understand it, they have agreed to the uh, no-fly zone in return for uh, saying nothing about the Saudis going into Bahrain last week. You have to look at this question, not just in terms of Libya, but in what's gone on in the whole of the Middle East over the last uh, you, you two would, months. But when we're talking about Libya, you would want to... Just let it happen, would you? It's not a question of just letting it happen. It's saying that the Libyan people themselves have to decide this. And I think it, the, uh, it's very but interesting... But they can't if they've got a superior army that's run well, by... Well, no, but it's very is interesting when you listen to Michael actually explaining the military situation here because the military situation is not just simply one of overwhelming force on the part of Gaddafi. Uh, he has some strength there, but he is not in a position just to attack Benghazi. But everyone, including the BBC, reported that 
the uh, that Saif Gaddafi's claim that they would be in Benghazi in 48 hours. They reported this as a fact, I think, because they wanted to get the no-fly zone, because they want to intervene in this region. And in my opinion, we have to oppose this intervention. We have seen many, many interventions in recent years which have been disastrous for the region. And when people say we have to do something, sometimes doing something is worse. And this be... doing something is going to okay, be much worse for the people of Libya. Professor Clark, you, you, well, your description, certainly you both agree, it's not necessarily tidy. Even to have a no-fly zone, you have to take out stuff on the ground, then it's near civilians, and then pretty soon, what, what, what happens here? You get we, we hear there's a, an SAS unit being captured or troops have had to go in on the ground, all of that. Yes, uh, I mean, these are all steps into the unknown. When military action is taken, everything changes, uh, and there's no way around that. And the military would be the first to tell you that that is the case. No plan survives first contact with the enemy. That's the a standard That's military right. uh, right. line. So you have, you, have, you have to accept it, w- w- th- that you're going into uncharted territory. So, so that does somewhat back uh, Lindsay's case, doesn't it? That once you're in, you're in. Oh, it's high-risk stuff, no question about it. And what if a pilot is shot down? I mean, all the limitations on the resolution so far, that there can't be ground invasion, all this kind of thing, if a pilot is shot down, if he's then produced on Libyan television, all the other things that we've seen in other conflicts, this can very easily escalate into a full-scale war. It is about the Western powers yet again trying to reassert their but control you, in this you're, region. You're not against military action in all circumstances, Lindsay, are you? So, for example, Srebrenica in Bosnia, where 8,000 men and boys were murdered, you would have stopped well, that? Well, actually, there was a Western force in Srebrenica, and they didn't yeah. intervene. Well, exactly. So, you would so have wanted them to. Actually, these military forces are not there to protect democracy. They're not there to protect... No, but people. I'm wondering whether there's if any circumstance the case, in which you would accept a well, military I, action I of any kind. I just think we have to look at what is going on in Libya. Um, Gaddafi was a friend of the West till two months ago. We got their oil and they got our arms and these arms are now being used against the uh, the people in uh, in Benghazi and in, and in the East. They've backed every dictator till two months ago. Mubarak killed hundreds and hundreds of people before he went in Egypt, but nobody suggested... But none of that, it. however terrible that is, none of that saves the people in Benghazi if Mr Gaddafi goes in this weekend. But look, we have to look at the full picture. I don't but how do you stop well, them being hurt? Michael, Michael has just said that Gaddafi isn't in a position to just go and conquer Benghazi in the next few days. That is simply not the case, and that indeed the no-fly zone won't make a great deal of difference. Well, maybe, in maybe... Bahrain, there are 400 people in prison at the moment, including the leader of the opposition. Why don't we do something about well, that? Well, that's true, Michael. Because you... yeah, these okay, are, well, let's put these that to Michael here. Sorry, yeah, these are loyal allies got... of, of Britain. All right, understood. France. Lots of bad things happening all over the world, world, Michael. Why Benghazi? Why not Bahrain? Why not Zimbabwe? Why not etc, etc? Well, there's a logical problem when you say you can't do anything until you can do everything. Um, every situation is messy and the fact is that sometimes military force makes a big difference, or, or could make a big difference. A small amount of military force could have stopped the slaughter of 800,000 people in Rwanda in 1994. Could it? With machetes, would that have actually no, done anything? No, a, a, small, a small military unit, if it had been deployed, I mean, a, 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 basically a, a, a battalion, a battalion task force, if it had been deployed in time, in 1994, the world has always lived with this sense of guilt, could have stopped almost a million people being killed inside six weeks. A relatively small military force, a brigade size, 5,000 troops, could have stopped the slaughter in Darfur. A small military force um, could have stopped the massacre in Srebrenica that you mentioned. That's not to say that military action is always right, but sometimes nothing else will do. When This is the problem that politicians have. They, they tend but, to use the military too quickly and too easily. Just run, but, but when uh, you need the military, when you need the military, nothing right. else will do. When you... Lindsay, if we were to have you back in a, in a month, and well, obviously we hope this is not the case, but if, if the no-fly zone didn't get up and running or whatever, Colonel Gaddafi went into Benghazi and 20,000 people were killed by his troops, would you honestly say it was good that the international community did not get involved? What I would say is that the people of the Middle East have to sort out these problems for themselves. They've done a fantastically good job of doing this. The Americans, two months ago, backed Mubarak, backed the uh, Ben Ali, the Tunisian Prime Minister and back Libya. Now, in, and they still back the dictators in the Gulf states. Now, in this situation, it's not saying we can't do anything until we do everything. We are talking about a specific region where the whole policy of the West has been to back these dictators. Thank you then very they much. Turn around and Thank say, you very much indeed. Lindsay German, Stop the War Coalition, and Michael, Professor Michael Clark, who's a military analyst and director of the Royal United Services Institute. It's Jeremy Vine on Radio 2. Yeah.